Good morning, everyone. We are on chapter 25 of Acts. Welcome to Becoming a Bible Nerd. We are going to try to wrap this chapter up, or this book up, next week um, on Tuesday. I'm going to see if I can get the rest of it in on Tuesday, but I can't promise anything. Um, we're going to try to do it today without a lot of distractions, but I've got my puppy here this morning that's already crying, so we'll see. Good morning, everybody. Um, I posted last night that we are definitely going to do Bible Nerds through the summer. We're going to start mid-June, and we're going to go on for seven weeks, and we will do um, First and Second Peter. Come here. We're going to do First and Second Peter. Everybody, meet Lexi. Um, and it's not going to just be me. There's going to be other teachers that you've already met along the way. So that's exciting. And it's just going to be on Thursday morning. So, and I'll confirm the time. It will probably be the same, but I'll confirm the time later. But I'm excited about this so that we won't lose momentum. We're going to get a nice study in in the summer. We're going to get to see what Peter's doing. Um, but we are going to slow down because we all know that um, summertime's crazy uh, for some of us because our kids are home. And so... We are going to get started on that. So this morning, Paul, we left off, and Paul was in a two-year waiting period in Caesarea Maritime under the governor, Felix. Felix uh, didn't really have anything to um, keep him locked up for, but he didn't want to make the Jewish people mad, so he's just procrastinated for two years. But during that time, Paul didn't sulk. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry. He made the most of his time, he waited, he wrote, and he witnessed to people who would come to visit or anyone that he got a chance to speak in front of. So he definitely made the most of every single moment of his time, and we talked about that last week and how we could do that in our waiting period. So today, we are going to pick up in chapter 25, and we have a new governor. So Felix is gone, and Festus has taken is uh, moved in and taking charge. He was more moderate. Remember, Felix had been a bond servant and he ruled with a slave mentality. He was very cruel um, and uh, he didn't care who he stepped on or what he did to them to rise to the top. We have Festus here and he's moderate and he's much more wise than Felix. So as soon as he gets in, he's going to go down to Jerusalem, up, excuse me, up to Jerusalem. And he's going to visit um, the uh, Jewish council there, the high priest and all the Sanhedrin. And he's really just becoming acquainted and familiar with the territory. Now, when he gets there, this is what was so crazy to me. He gets there. He's just trying to get his bearings. He's trying to meet people. And immediately they start in on Paul's case. And they want Paul's case to be um, presented uh in Jerusalem because they still have this ambush to kill him. And so after two years have gone by and the moment that this new guy gets in office, they attack him. They haven't rested one bit. They haven't forgotten about Paul. And it just shows that to me, you have to see something spiritual going on because that's not normal for them to be so hung up on this guy just because he spoke against their beliefs. And so, definitely, you see um, something spiritual going on. Oh, this dog does nothing but bite me. Um, so, Festus, Festus declined sending him there, um, and he had the case brought before him in Caesarea. Uh, the Jews had a weak case. Um, they couldn't bear any proof. Now, we saw this in Jesus' trial where there were some witnesses that were brought forth, and they just made up some things that they heard Jesus do and say. And if you had two or more witnesses, then there it was. It was proof. It was as good as gold. Roman government doesn't quite work that way, and that is going to be in Paul's favor. They demand more proof, and they, they search out to see if the witnesses are reliable and if this really happened. So... They go in much more in depth in their cases, and so there's no burden, there's no proof here um, of what uh, they were accusing Paul of. So Festus ended up asking Paul, though, um, can uh, stop, stop. Um, Festus ends up asking Paul if he would rather be tried in Jerusalem because he still wanted to win favor with all of these um, political leaders in Jerusalem, and immediately. He used his Roman get-out-of-jail-free citizen card and said, I appeal to Caesar. He knew 
already in his heart that God was going to send him to Rome. And he's seeing this as a chance. He doesn't want to be sent to Jerusalem. They're going to kill him on the way. They're going to make sure that they're... Uh, that he is destroyed, and so he knew the safest and best route was for him to appeal to Caesar. That meant he had to go to the emperor in Rome to be um, heard. Now, Caesar is a title. It was the first dictator of Rome's name who made this Roman Empire, Julius Caesar. You had to read about him in school. That was his surname, but now there's been other people to take his place, and it has become like a dynasty name, a title for that position. For emperor, right now it's the emperor Nero that is um, in charge, and he was known to turn against um, Christianity pretty harshly. But at this time, this was a few years before it was evident, and so Paul would have had no clue how nasty he was. Um, and so this is where we're at. He appealed to Nero. Now, since uh, Festus was new. We had King Agrippa, who was a Her from the Herod dynasty. We had King Agrippa and his sister Bernice go, and they're just making their way down to meet this new governor, and um, they visit him. Let's talk a minute about these two uh, people. King Agrippa, and I went ahead and attached a chart again for these this uh, Herodian family line. These are descendants from Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the king that killed all baby infants during the time of Jesus because he felt threatened that a king was going to be born. Um, since then, he had many sons, and one of his sons had um, Herod Agrippa I, who we have already studied about in this chapter. He imprisoned Peter, and he executed James, the son of Zebedee, John's brother. So, this Herod that did these things had a son named Herod Agrippa II, and this is who we're talking about today. He's 30 years old. He's here with his sister. This is weird. There was a lot of, there's no proof of this, but there was a lot of speculation that Bernice and Agrippa had an incestuous relationship. They lived together, and she also for a while was married to her uncle and a couple of other prominent uh, figures, but... Um, she spends most of her time with her brother. Um, these are the last of the Herodian dynasty, and they're considered the best of them. Um, Herod Agrippa II is the superintendent of the temple in Jerusalem and had the power to appoint the high priest. So he was the guy appointing who was going to be the current high priest of this time. Um, these two, Herod Agrippa and Bernice, had a sister. Oh, Felix, the governor from last chapter, his sister, Drusella, was the sibling of Agrippa and Bernice. And these three siblings were considered full Jew. Now, we've studied earlier that the Herods were half Jew. They were from Idumea, which were Edomites that moved to Jerusalem and intermarried with Jerusalemites. So, um, Jerusalemites. I don't know if I just made that up. <laughs> um, so, Herod was part Jew, Herod the Great, and so were his ancestors, but... One of Herod the Great's wives, one of them, which would be these guys' great-grandmother, was a full Jewish woman. And remember in earlier chapters we studied that for some reason in this culture, the um, what determined if you were Jew or not is if your mother was a full Jew. We were talking about Timothy, I think, during that time. So these three would be considered full Jews, and they had a lot of respect with the Jewish people. They were um, Agrippa II was very into the Jewish festivals and would go in, they said, with pomp and circumstance, whatever that is. But you can just imagine that he got into it, wore his fancy clothes, and made a big deal about his appearance. So... um. Festus knows, that, okay, here's some Jewish people. They um, are very um, schooled in Jewishness and the law. And so I want these people to hear this case so they can help me. He, um, Paul, just appealed to Caesar. And Festus is going to have to write a letter to the emperor. And he doesn't exactly even know what to write. So he's hoping to get some help here. Um so after listening to Festus, Agrippa, uh, Agrippa wants to hear Paul, and so that's what we're going to talk about in the next chapter. We are going to hear Paul's defense. This is just, um, this really isn't a court of law. This is just a formality, but in the next chapter, we'll hear Paul's offense, defense to Agrippa. 
And um, so this is where we are today. Just another fact about um, this importance of Jewishness that we were talking about, how these three were um, fully Jew. Um, this is important. This is so important in this day. And in fact, um, in the Gospel of Luke, um, there is the genealogy of Christ. And it's a little bit different from the one in Matthew. The one in Matthew is um, Matthew is writing the genealogy of Christ to prove that he is heir to the throne, the son of David. And uh, I mean, the son, yes, well, he came from the line of David, so he was heir to the throne through his father, I think. I hope I'm not getting this switched. Luke does the genealogy on the mother's side, and so that is important, and I didn't know until this study that the point of that was to prove his Jewishness. Luke wanted to prove, so there was never any question in this, that Jesus' mother was a full Jew, and um, that was so important in this day. That's just a fun fact for you. So, um, anyway, what we're going to see in this next chapter is Paul go before Herod, and he is going to use this opportunity to witness to him. He is do, saying his defense, but it is jam-packed full of the message of the gospel, and his motive is that King Herod hear the truth and the good news of the gospel. So everywhere we've seen Paul, no matter what his circumstances are, we have seen him basically um, say, here I am, Lord, use me. And I'm doing a study of Genesis right now, and that is something that has come up time and time again. Our patriarchs, our, our forefathers in um, Judaism have um, all had this heart at some time in their life. They've actually said, here I am, Lord, use me. And um, I had, while I was studying this and thinking upon this yesterday, a friend of mine that's a fellow Bible nerd, uh, she texted me and she was talking about um, having a change of job and she was trying to get a job and there was one that she absolutely didn't want but there were all these other doors that she could have gone through and with everything within her means she tried to go through these other doors and one by one they all slammed shut forcing her to take the job that she did not want but she said she finally got to a point where that's literally what she said was here I am Lord use me and um, she went to this job that she was dreading and it has been um, on the level service level I'm sure it's difficult she has to work nights and she has to work with difficult patients but um, the things that the Lord is doing during these nighttime hours using her to minister to staff um, that work with her and other patients have been unbelievable and I've been been able to follow her um, kind of on this journey but um, all she said was here I am Lord use me and all of these doors start opening for her in ministry. And these doors are open all around. But if we don't have that heart where we're saying, God, I want to be used. We get so busy with our day-to-day -day time that we just pass through. There's door after door and we pass through. We don't even have eyes to see. But in the stillness of the night, she's gotten her Bible out and she's had time to pray. And the Lord has opened door after door after door. And her heart is in a posture that is ready for this. And so she's been able to recognize it. And it's been a fun ride. Um, one of the things that she sent me yesterday, though, was that it's almost overwhelming to her what God is doing. And she said that she knows this isn't right thinking. But she can't help but ask, what did I do to deserve this? Um, that she's not worthy of such honor and that she's a sinner who falls short of righteousness daily and she feels like there's so many better more equipped Christians to choose from and um, she was just asking me about this and of course whenever um, we make that step to live for the Lord and do more for his kingdom the devil is gonna come and attack that's a given but um, I, I just wanted to sit and think a minute that just on the goodness of God, that's God's grace. None of us live a righteous, so righteously that we could just be like, oh, I've got this. We all fall short daily, every single one of us, and the difference is who God uses and who he doesn't use is the person that just stands still and says, here I am, God, use me. And then they move towards obedience. They recognize open doors and then they grab a hold of them and they capitalize on those opportunities. So we see Paul, definitely somebody who falls short um, on his own merits, somebody who had hatred in his heart. He was a murderer. And we see the grace of God come in and say, I want to use you, Paul. You've got the brains. You've got the knowledge. You have that personality. Um, I want to use you for something huge. 
And that's what God is looking for. Just somebody to say, here I am, God, use me. Um, he's not looking for perfection. None of us would be able to be doing anything for the kingdom if that's what he was looking for. He's just looking for willingness. So today, I just encourage you, be willing. Say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Ask God to show you open doors. And we're going to talk a little bit more about a couple of things that we can do to get those doors open that I've experienced in my own life and I've had friends experience. Um, just little tiny things that you can do that help usher in those open doors. So Paul is going to use this opportunity to spread the gospel to King Agrippa. We're going to finish that on Thursday in chapter 26. I know I don't, I don't think I read anything today. We just talked, but we'll finish that um, on Thursday. And then following Tuesday, I'm going to try to wrap up all of Acts because 27 is a shipwreck um, chapter. And um, there's not a whole lot of, uh, well, I say that, but in the beginning of Matthew, I said don't skip over the genealogy because there's so much there. So I'm going to keep studying and see when I can dig out. And then um, if we don't get to it, we'll wrap up Thursday. I hope you have a great week. Happy reading. See you later.